wonderful start to the school year, no matter how you're doing it, if you're back to school in person, if you're going virtually, or if you're doing some mix of the two. This week, to kick everything off, we're going to read a really cool book about a really cool girl who did something amazing when she was 11. The book is The Girl Who Named Pluto, the story of Venetia Burney, and it is by Alice B. McGinty, and it's illustrated by Elizabeth Haley. Now, just like we've done before, I want you to be thinking about one question while we're reading the book. What two things, two, did Venetia put together in order to come up with her name for Pluto? And we'll have some more fun activities at the end, too. But for now, let's start reading The Girl Who Named Out of the classroom, down the hallway, and out the door, Venetia Burney and her schoolmates followed their teacher, leaving their British schoolhouse behind. It is the year 1930, and they are counting their steps from the sun, a circle drawn on their classroom blackboard. 39, 40, 41, Miss Claxton reads, her words as precise as her footsteps. At exactly 41 paces from the sun, they lay down a bird seed, Mercury. At 77 paces, they place a P, Venus. Next, a larger P, Earth. After placing a B for Mars and an orange for Jupiter, the largest planet, they stop at 1,019 paces inside University Park. There, they lay down a golf ball, Saturn. There are two more planets in the solar system, Uranus and Neptune, but Ms. Claxton tells her students that they are too far away. She will let their imagination finish the planet walk. When Venetia and her friends return to the park later with lumps of clay for the planet, they run counting paces to Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, all the way to Neptune. Venetia's imagination whirls, trying to fathom the real distances. She has memorized each number. Stormy blue Neptune orbits 2.79 billion miles from the sun. And what lies beyond? How far does the solar system reach? Venetia brings her questions to breakfast each morning, and Grandfather Medan answers as many as he can. She and Mother have been living with Grandfather since Venetia's father died. Old and stately like the Oxford Library where he was head librarian, Grandfather knows that questions lead to learning, and his family is afire with learning. Venetia asks, how many moons does Saturn have? Nine moons have been discovered so far. Venetia asks, where did the name Neptune come from? From the Roman god of the sea. Along with the planets, Venetia is learning about Greek and Roman gods. When she reads about Mars, the Roman god of war, she is reminded of her great uncle, Henry Medan, a science master who named the two moons orbiting the planet. He chose Phobos and Deimos, Mars's, two, t Mars's twin sons, moons and planets named from legend. What a marvelous link between science and story. At breakfast one Friday, as grandfather sifts through the newspaper, he starts to read aloud. A new planet, discovery by Lowell Observatory. Professor, ha Professor Harlow Shapley announced today that the Lowell Observatory at Flagstaff, Arizona had discovered a ninth major planet. The planet, which has not yet been named, is beyond Neptune. A new planet? Venetia leans forward in her chair. Another lump of clay to add to their model. I wonder what it should be called, Grandfather says, his brow creased. Venetia's imagination takes off flying, leaping, connecting the dots from science to story. She knows that this planet, so far from the sun, must be frozen, dark, and lifeless. It would be, the un it would be like the underworld, the underworld ruled in Roman myth by Neptune's brother, Pluto. It might be called Pluto. Grandfather's eyes widen. He loves the name. He tells Venetia that he'll share her idea with his friend, Professor Herbert Hall Turner of the Royal Astronomical Society. Perhaps he has a say in the decision. After the 
Anisha leaves for school, grandfather, grandfather writes this note. Dear Professor, Blessed if my little granddaughter, Venetia Burney, didn't up and suggest a name to which me seems thoroughly suitable. Pluto. Sincerely, Madame. On his way to the library, Grandfather drops off the note at the professor's home. Meanwhile, not far away, Venetia and her schoolmates are buzzing with excitement about the new planet. They fire question after question at Miss Claxton. How is it discovered? By whom? How many billion miles from the sun? How many places beyond Neptune? Miss Claxton promises to find out. That evening, Venetia lies in bed, her mind adrift with Planet X. In the flurry of her thoughts spins one name, Pluto. Couldn't it be the name for the new planet? Were the astronomers deciding now? Saturday morning dawns, and Venetia and Grandfather search the papers for more information about Planet X. Mostly, though, they wait to hear from the professor. That afternoon, a response arrives. My dear Madame, I got your note on my return from London. I think Pluto excellent. We did not manage to think of anything so good at the Royal Astronomical Society yesterday. The professor's note goes on to say that he has written to the astronomers at Lowell about Pluto. It will be up to them to decide. A week goes by. At school, Venetia works on her lessons in math, science, and history. At home, she and Grandfather keep busy, reading, playing, and waiting. Will the astronomers like her idea? March turns to April, and Venetia waits. April drags on. Outside the trees spout leaves, and Venetia waits. If Venetia was, could see what was happening across the ocean, she would find that Pluto had made its way through the doors of the Lowell Observatory to Clyde Tomba, the shy assistant who discovered Planet X. His first choice for a name? Pluto. Not only is it perfect fit for this dark, icy world, but the first two letters are PL, the initials of astronomer Percival Lowell, who began the search for the planet. Finally, at the end of the month, the astronomers vote. It's unanimous. The ninth planet will be named Pluto. When Grandfather shares the news with Venetia, she beams, her eyes radiant. Grandfather sends a check to Miss Claxton, thanking her for teaching. With the money, the school purchases a gramophone and names it Pluto. Venetia is a hero. As Venetia grows, Pluto tilts and spins in its long, slow orbit around the sun. It shares that outer reaches of the solar system with other spheres newly discovered by astronomers. Venetia gets older and older still. Her hair turns silver. In one gray July afternoon, the day before her 89th birthday, she travels to the Observatory Science Center near the southern tip of England. She has been invited to view Pluto through a telescope, her first time ever. It's raining, though, and it takes a clear sky to see the dwarf planet. But as Venetia nears, the rain stops and the clouds begin to part. A lovely sunset fills the sky. Later, the darkness twinkling with stars, Venetia and the scientists climb to the observatory's dome where the 111-year-old telescope is waiting. The scientists locate Pluto, and Venetia puts her eyes to the lens. By God, she says in an awed voice, there it is, that icy sphere spinning 3.67 billion miles from the sun, many paces past Neptune, and its name is Pluto. And Remember, I asked you to listen to answer the question, what does Venetia put together to name Pluto? So you have an answer? Right, science and story. She puts science and Roman myth together to come up with the name Pluto. And if you don't know about Roman myth, there's stories based on Greek myth. They're a lot like fairy tales about the way
way ancient Rome and Greece were founded, and essentially the Romans took the Greek stories and adapted them. And if you're interested in these stories, and they're super cool, my daughter, who is almost seven, loves them, get this book, The Lair's Book of Greek Myth. It's the perfect book for kids that are interested in le um, learning about myths. And you can go through and read all these awesome stories and think about ways you could put science and these really ancient stories together to create new things. And one of the things we'd love for you to think about this week is what you would put together. What would you put together to create something new like Venetia does? She named a planet when she was 11, but would you maybe put um, biomechanical engineering together with the Cinderella story to come up with something brand new or something totally, totally different, like maybe biomechanical engineering and dance. It's really fun to think of things that we don't always put together and think of ways you could put them together, like science and art, and come up with really interesting things. Some of the world's best inventions come from thinking creatively and putting things together that you wouldn't necessarily do every day. Now, the other thing that's really cool about the Pluto story is that in 2005, astronomers discovered something that made us make made us think about Pluto a little bit differently. And some of you might know this and some of you might not. But what we really want you to do is do some research. If you're old enough to do it on your own, please do. If not, ask a parent to help you. And figure out how do we think about Pluto now? What's changed? What did scientists discover? And I want to recommend another really fun book to do that. This is A Place for Pluto. And it talks a lot about the scientific discovery of Pluto and some new things we figured out since Venetia first named it around 1930. Now one of the last activities I'd love to share with you, and I hope you'll share with us if you do it, is that kids can do anything. I mean, Venetia named a planet when she was only 11, and she's the only child that has ever done this. But what do you want to do? What is your big dream? And don't let being a kid stop you from trying to do it. Remember, Venetia had help. Her grandfather helped her. So the adults around you in your life, a teacher, a parent, an aunt, an uncle, even a neighbor, could help you make this big discovery or do this wonderful activity. So think about your dreams and make a plan to achieve them and think about who might help you, even if you're only 11 or younger. So thanks so much for Ro joining us this week for Rosie Reads. We'll be back next week with another exciting story. And don't forget to check out Rosie makes on Friday. We're going to make some really cool biomechanical hands. You might have been the reason I was talking about my biomechanics. And please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you get all of this really fun content to help you with your STEM studies during the year and are the first to see it. Thanks, everyone.